is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then, the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news you definitely won't find on CNN or Fox. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and um, we are now into the days um, of this year that mark the um, palindrome days. You know, a palindrome is something that is the same forward and backwards. So 9-10-19 is 9 one one 9 um it's and then if you look at it backwards it's still 91019 and we have this through of course the 19th and excuse me um, I took a breath and I sort of gasped weirdly um speaking of weird news host gasps weirdly on weird news podcast anyway um of course last year they would have been in the 18s before that they would have been the 17s um in July August etc so you get the palindrome years palindrome days this is the beginning of the 2019 palindrome days, just in case you were wondering. Speaking of wondering, I wondered last episode what a group of raccoons are called. I did not know, so I said I would look it up, and I did. And a group of raccoons are called, uh, most commonly came, what came up was a gaze, and secondly was a nursery. A gaze of raccoons, or a nursery of raccoons. I am fascinated by all of these names. Why are there so many names? different names for groups of animals. I mean, groups of people, you kind of just have groups, right? I'm sure there, yeah, there, no, there are other synonyms, but groups of animals, a murder of crows, you know, you've got herds, you've got um, flocks, you've got all kinds of things, but a gaze, I, I I don't know. It makes no sense. Um, nursery, I could maybe see, you know, baby. I mean, if it's a, it's a group of baby raccoons, that would make perfect sense. But you could have nurseries of other animals as well. Um, so a gaze of raccoons. This is what I learned um, because of this podcast. And I pass that information along to you. I do like learning new words and new things. And so now I'm going to have to start talking about a gaze of raccoons in order to um, you know, solidify that in my brain so that I can actually remember it um, five minutes from now because, yeah, I, I I might forget it. But they say if you use a new word at least three times, um, it, it's yours, at least for a while. <laughs> Speaking of raccoons, um, a gaze of raccoons uh, were captured in an Ontario neighborhood recently. Um doing some have uh, displaying some interesting behavior these raccoons seemed to be drunk actually they were likely drunk because they had been eating fermented fruit um, emily rogers said she arrived home uh to find a raccoon stumbling around oddly in her backyard in the stittsville area of ottawa this would frighten me if i found a raccoon wandering around you know stumbling around strangely because then you have you you know my my brain would immediately go to what is wrong with that raccoon does it have rabies is it sick does it have something that i should be worried about um so uh emily rogers said he couldn't really move he was dragging his legs he was wobbling having a hard time standing up you could tell something was wrong with him for sure that sounds awful Another area resident, Julie Fong, said a bylaw officer came to her door Sunday asking her asking to go into her backyard to look for a raccoon spotted in the area um, that witnesses said appeared intoxicated. So that's why this guy was kind of sleeping it off under our deck, Fong said. There was a drunk raccoon under our deck. <laughs> well, at least you found in theory, a safe place to sleep it off. Um, my Michael Runtz, a biology professor at uh, Carleton University, said the raccoons were likely getting drunk off of fermented fruit, which makes sense. 
He said it's possible that some of the fruit is fermenting under the heat and that these guys are getting a bit tipsy by eating that fermenting fruit. Runtz said the best thing to do is to leave the raccoons to sober up on their own. Oh, poor. Hydrate, raccoons. Go hydrate, please. Um, Runtz said, don't try to give them coffee and get them sobered up. Just let them go their course. That never occurred to me. I It never would have occurred to me to be like, come here, little raccoon. I have some coffee for you. Let's try to get you sobered up. I don't know if I had thought about sobering up a raccoon, how I would have gone about it, but I, yeah, that has never occurred to me. If you were to try and sober up a raccoon, which I do not recommend, I am not suggesting that in this segment of the podcast, but um, let's say hypothetically, or you were writing a short story or you were creating some sort of funny comic or, or something that involved sobering up a raccoon, what would be your method of choice, your sober up method for raccoons? I would love to hear your thoughts because that would be awesome. Um, police in Milton, West Virginia, said in November of 2018 that some raccoons were spotted acting strangely in that area, and it had prompted numerous calls about potentially rabid animals, but the raccoons, again, turned out to be drunk from eating fermented crab apples. So it's not the first time. It's not just Canadian raccoons who are getting drunk off the fermented fruit. Nope. U.S. raccoons are getting drunk as well. And I can see it. I mean, we have multiple fruit trees in our backyard. And I have been fairly diligent, trying to have tried to be fairly diligent about picking up the deadfall, the the ones, the windfalls, the ones that fall off the tree, mostly because we have two little mischievous dogs who will eat them and they just don't need all that sugar and, you know, they'll just get fat. <laughs> Our girl dog is already um, probably fatter than she needs to be. She doesn't need to be eating fruit off the ground. But hey, I also don't need drunk chihuahuas. They have uh, some strange behavioral patterns to begin with without them being drunk. So if you see drunk raccoons, either singular, a raccoon, or plural, a, a gaze of drunk raccoons. Oh man, that should be the short story title. Okay, everybody, submit your short stories to me, a gaze of drunk raccoons, <laughs> and, and, and describe how they are acting and uh, what you, as the, uh, as the protagonist in this story, does to sober up your gaze of drunk raccoons. That would be, I think, an awesome short story contest. I have no authority to create a short story contest. I have nothing to give you for a short story contest except for the honor of winning um, best short story about drunk a drunken gaze of raccoons. That's all I got. Actually, that's not all I have because I decided as part of the story that I should Google just the phrase drunk raccoons. And of course, there the stories come up about the Canadian raccoons and the West Virginia raccoons. The number of news outlets that reported on the drunk Canadian raccoons cracked me up. But there are also... Pictures, of course, of drunk raccoons, not nearly as entertaining as the YouTube videos of drunk raccoons. If you would like to fall down a rabbit hole or haha, a raccoon hole of, um, you know, silly Internet stories and silly Internet videos, then maybe Googling drunk raccoons is the way to go. Um, you might learn something about what it's like to be a drunk raccoon. I don't know. At any rate, I think it's time to take our first break of the podcast because otherwise I'll just keep talking about I'll just keep saying the phrase drunk raccoons. And um, I do not want you to make a drinking game out of this and then be drunk podcast listeners. I don't I don't recommend that. So no drinking games. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, we'll be talking about um, bearded dragons going to college. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. And I'll be right back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Yeah. 
Welcome back to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. Um, except for in this in this recap, I am not. I was talking before the break about drunk raccoons. I will not say that phrase anymore. Um, I will move on. And as I mentioned before the break, we're moving on to uh, another animal story, but this time reptiles. This time bearded dragons. Or at least in this case, bearded dragon, singular. I have three bearded dragons, so I almost always say dragons, plural. That's just because I have three of them. They're surprisingly, um, they have their own personalities. They like to snuggle. They're really interesting. I never thought having a reptile as a pet would be all that interesting, you know? But uh, they they definitely, each of the three has its own personality. Uh, Again, they like to snuggle. Uh, They... Yeah, they're just, they're very interesting. But um, this is a story about a bearded dragon who went to school. Again, a perfect short story opportunity. The bearded dragon who goes to school. You could do all kinds of things to make that up. A Florida school district is reminding pa- uh, reminding parents, typo, it says patents. And I was trying to figure out what patents had to do with this, this. Let me start over. A Florida school district is reminding parents to check their children's backpacks before school after a student smuggled a bearded dragon into class. And before the break, I said college. I didn't mean college. Obviously, I meant just school, but college came out of my mouth. But um, the Bay County... Oh, look, it's Florida also. Um, uh, Yet another story about Florida. But this time it's not Florida man or Florida woman. This time it's Florida child and Florida bearded dragon. The Bay County School District said the bearded dragon named Django was given a temporary home in a courier box until the student's parents could come take the pet home. The district said a backpack is not a good place for a bearded dragon to spend the day. And you know what? It's not. Bearded dragons, I sometimes don't know how they survive in the wild. They need such specific things. I mean, one day they it would probably be okay, especially in Florida where it's warm. But they need specific temperatures. They need specific amounts of humidity. They need calcium in their diet. They need this. They need that. They need UVB rays. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's really, it, it is not for the faint of heart if you want reptiles because they need very specific environments. And um, so, yeah, a bearded dragon in a backpack for one day, probably okay, but it's, it's really not the best plan. At any rate, um, his student owner didn't want him to be sad at home all day alone. Aw. So she brought him to school for some company, the district said. That is so sweet. The school district asked parents to remember to check backpacks in the morning before school. <laughs> um, y- you know those signs that you see in public places where you know there's going to be a story behind that well the sign you know this isn't a sign but uh i can just picture a sign it could be in the short story Uh, i could just picture a sign that says parents remember to check your kids backpack for bearded dragons before letting them leave for school in the morning (laughs) you know there's a story behind that but Django is um well, it's quite an adorable little bearded dragon. They did find um, a, a courier box, one of those plastic boxes that you see or get at the post office for mail. And um, the bearded dragon has a little pillow and it looks like a little blanket. So being very spoiled, of course, that pillow is going to get pooped on. But whatever. Um <laughs> This is just how I think, being a bearded dragon pet mom. I put mine in the tub every morning, so they poop there and not in their cage. TMI, I know. Let's uh, let's just move on. We're gonna we're gonna stick with Florida, though. We're gonna stay in the state of Florida, and this time we are talking about a message in a bottle. Have you ever done a message in a bottle? Do you know anyone who has ever sent a message in a bottle or found a message in a bottle? You know, you read about it all the time. There are movies based on it. There's all kinds of plots based on the concept of a message in a bottle. But I have neither sent one nor have I ever found one. Although you hear stories and this is a story of that. The This piece of um, what could have been lost property, actually, which was... It was turned in as lost property to the Florida Sheriff's deputy, um, to a Florida, Florida, Florida Sheriff's deputy. (laughs) I swear I haven't been eating fermented fruit. Um, after being found on a beach actually wound up being that message in a bottle. 
not just a message in a bottle, though. This contained the ashes of a family member. The Walton County Sheriff's Office said Sergeant Paula Pendleton was on patrol Thursday when she was given a piece of quote-unquote lost property found on a Gulf of Mexico beach. The item turned out to be a bottle containing two notes, four $1 bills, and a small pouch of human ashes. Uh, I'm that's a good citizen who didn't just take the money and chuck the bottle. Uh, so this bottle contains the cremation ashes of my son, Brian, who suddenly and unexpectedly passed on March 9th, 2019. One of the notes said more than anything, he longed to be free. So I'm sending him on one last adventure. Oh, that makes me, that makes me a little teary. Um, the note said Brian Mullins of Dallas, Texas, died at age 39. So he made it from Dallas to uh, to somewhere in Florida. That's pretty impressive. Another note said, hi, my name is Peyton. When my father passed, I was 14 years old. Oh, this is killing me. Uh, it has struck our whole family pretty hard. And so far, it has been a very hard road. But like my granny said, he loved to be free. So that's exactly what we are doing, she wrote. The note said the $4 enclosed in the bottle was meant to cover the cost of a phone call to the family to let them know where the bottle ended up. Pendleton said she contacted the family via text message to tell them that Brian's journey would continue. I am putting the note back into the bottle with Brian's ashes and delivering it to a friend who is a charter boat captain, she wrote. He has offered to bring Brian way out into the Gulf so he can continue his adventure. But before that, I want you to know he got to do a ride along with a deputy before drifting out once again. Okay, A, the fact that somebody turned this in and didn't just throw it away or take the money and throw it away. They actually read what was in there and, and did something with it is amazing. Thank you for being uh, kind humans. humans. And um, the, then the fact that the officer to whom it was turned in contacted the family sent them a very nice text message and took the extra step of i mean probably the ride along was riding back to the police station i would assume i don't know maybe brian got to go and you know bust somebody (laughs) or i don't even know but the fact that the the officers took this the step beyond just contacting the family and actually said that she would give the bottle with the ashes to a friend to continue that journey is pretty cool i have no idea what the laws about human remains are in terms of having them in a bottle and chucking them i mean uh, there i think rules are different in every state but i don't know for sure but Clearly, this adventure is going to continue for Brian, and it's a pretty cool story. A little weird. It's not something that you expect when you're walking on a beach to find even a note in a bottle, let alone um, two notes, four dollars, and human remains. Now, I should say ashes. I know human remains makes it sound a little more morbid than it is. What it doesn't say is whether or not she put the $4 back in there. <laughs> she, the, the text said, I'm putting the note back into the bottle with Brian's ashes and delivering it to a friend who is a charter boat captain. Um, and But it does not say if she put the $4 back in there. She seems from this brief, brief encounter I've had with her over internet and talking to you that like she's a good person so i'm guessing that she put the four dollars back in there it's not like a text costs her any certainly not four dollars to send that text to the family but anyway that i think is a um weird in a sweet kind of way and you know i think we need some weird and sweet kinds of way stories in our lives so brian we wish you bon voyage we uh, i would I hope the family gets another text or a call or an email or something that, well, I I guess it would have to be a a phone call since the number is in there. But I I hope that they get to follow Brian on his journey, and I hope that it brings them some joy and some peace and uh, some bright spots into what is obviously a dark time in their family's lives. So... Again, bon voyage, Brian. We are going to take our second break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be wrapping up this episode with some stories of amusement park 
parks. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, and I'll be right back. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA, it's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC Weird News Podcast. Before the break, we had two stories from Florida, although not as crazy as our Florida-related stories usually are, and that's uh, a bit of a nice break from those types of stories. As I said before the break, haha, no pun intended. It's not really even a pun. It's just a repetitive word. But uh, before the break, I said we would be moving on to some stories centered around amusement parks. And the first story is um, about a theft, which is interesting because it's not just a theft of something small that you could like you know, like I'm, when you think amusement park and you think theft, you think pickpocket, uh, you know, do work in the crowd, stealing something or maybe taking uh, something from one of the booths, you know, like one of the stuffed animals stealing, you know, shoplifting, those sorts of things. Mm -mm, no, no, no. This was a uh, kitty roller coaster and it was stolen in Ohio. A kitty roller, roller coaster. This is not something that you could just like slip into your pocket and uh, skulk off with. No. Um, it's a Go Gator kitty roller coaster, and it was stolen from the Union County Fairgrounds in Marysville, Ohio. The Union County Sheriff's Office is looking for a white Dodge Ram with a flatbed that was spotted by a traffic camera taking the roller coaster. So it, <laughs> it's, it's not like it's, it's not like it. Would, you know how you sometimes see. Um, uh, I don't mean to bring up sad topics, but like Amber Alerts, where they give you the car make. There's, I don't know that I would ever notice. I mean, I, I, I could notice, you know, okay, it's a white, whatever. But um, a white Dodge Ram carrying a roller coaster, that sticks out a little bit more than just your average sedan or compact or what have you. The truck was seen pulling the purple and green trailer that contained the roller coaster. The ride was reported as stolen on August 28th. The trailer has a license plate that was registered in Maine. The truck had no visible front plate. The Go Gator can be found at carnivals and state fairs and is meant for children to ride. The roller coaster, which is worth about $50,000, has alligator-themed cars that measure 20 feet in length. Once again, somebody write a short story about this because there is clearly more to this story. Obviously, we need to know the thief's motivations. We need to know what the thief is planning on doing with the go-gator. Maybe the thief has noble purposes and is stealing this for, um, a, you know, a sick child who just wants to ride the go-gator one more time but can't leave to go to the fair. And so they, they're stealing. The, clearly, I'm just saying there's there's a myriad of possibilities for what this story could be. And if for those of you who are, you know, looking for ideas of what to write, you're welcome. <laughs> just tune into this podcast and I'll just keep throwing ideas at you um, because I apparently am not going to write them. I, yeah, whatever. We're not going to go there. So amusement parks, that would be the theft of the go-gator. This next one is not about a theft, but it is about uh, a challenge. And Six Flags is seeking brave pairs for a 30-hour challenge. It is a, um, so let's just, let's just jump in. A Maryland theme park is challenging couples to spend 30 hours together in an unusual tight space for the 30-hour coffin challenge. A, why 30 hours? 24 hours? Plus six? What's the? Anyway, the competition, which is part of Six Flags America's Fright Fest 2019, will see six couples of any sort, so romantic pairs, family members, or friends, spending 30 hours in a coffin together 
from 4 p.m. September 27th until 10 p.m. September 28th. I have so many questions. Uh, the couples will be allowed to have a friend nearby during park hours, but they will be alone when the park is closed. That is alone, save for some fright fest ghouls, that's a quote, who will, quote, be lurking about in the darkness. Okay, so the couples are allowed to have a friend nearby, but then they'll be alone, but they'll be alone together, right? Aren't they together in coffins? Are they together in the same coffin? Are they together in separate coffins? I mean, because the same coffin, that would be a very tight space. Um, the, ta- the, smart, the, the participants will not be allowed to use their smartphones or other electronic devices except during designated break times. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear there are designated break times because you cannot spend 30 hours in a coffin without having to pee, right? Um, anyone who gets out of their coffin for any reason, with the exception of the designated bathroom and meal breaks, will be automatically disqualified and not eligible to win the contest, the park said. The couple remaining at the end of the 30-hour challenge will receive $600, a pair of 2020 gold season passes, and a Fright Fest prize package. This is the couple remaining at the end of the 30-hour challenge, but couldn't there be more than one couple who actually makes it the whole 30 hours? That doesn't seem unrealistic to me. Um, participants will potentially be exposed to fog, dramatic light- lighting, flash photography, and extreme weather conditions. Oh my, so they're not going to be inside. The registration deadline for the challenge is September 9th, so I do apologize. It was yesterday. You missed it <laughs> if you wanted to. I've got to find out what how this goes and what the what what happens. I mean, are they going... I can see where, you know, you just, you get a little freaked out uh, spending the night. There, there is a picture, and I, so this makes me think that they've either done this before or they re, they enacted it. They had people enact the scenes so they could take a picture of it. People are wearing hats and, you know, they're in sleeping bags. So clearly this is outside. And the end of September in uh, Maryland could be, could be pretty chilly. So, huh. Would you spend 30 hours in a coffin to win $600 and a, and a season pass? Guess it depends on how much you really like Six Flags. Um, oh, and also a Fright Fest prize package. So I do not know what the Fright Fest prize package, which is great alliteration, but I do not know what that prize package might contain in addition to the $600 and a pair of 2020 gold season passes. But at any rate... Uh, would you spend 30 hours in a coffin with a partner? Whether they're... Uh, the, okay, so the picture does not appear that they are both in the same coffin. I still think that would be funnier <laughs> if you were just crammed in there. Oh, you would have some good, good quality time, wouldn't you? But um, would I spend 30 hours in a coffin? Probably not for $600. Maybe for more. Um, would I, I, I don't have any problem sleeping outside at night. I don't really like to be scared, so I would probably manage to freak myself out. But, you know, if you, if it wouldn't be like I was alone, I, again, I don't know the exact rules. I'm just looking at the picture that is provided with the article. Um, so you're not, I don't think you'd be alone, especially if you are there with, you know, as a couple, you could talk to your your spouse, significant other, brother, sister, uncle, friend from childhood, whatever it might be, you'd have somebody to talk you down from being freaked out. Make sure you choose the right person, though. Do not choose the person who's going to wind you up and make you freaked out. Because why would they do that if they wanted to win? But some people just like to freak other people out. I don't know. I don't think I have any need to prove that I can spend 30 hours in a coffin. Like I said, don't have any problems sleeping outside and have a good sleeping bag, but don't really need to take part in this challenge. So it's okay because I missed the deadline and I don't live anywhere near Maryland, Maryland, but I will have to put this on my list of things to check at the end of the month and see who won and how the contest went. So 
Between now and then, there will be more episodes of the Weird News Podcast, but that is the end of this particular episode of the Weird News Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me, and join me again next time because the world is a very weird place, and I will bring you stories of that weirdness. Thanks.